Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, the afternoon session of our Justice Center Summit on Photographic Evidence. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our Assistant Chief, Eric Fisher. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Davin. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Eric Fisher. I'm the Assistant Chief for Region 5. Um, Region 5 of the Justice Center covers the seven counties of the Hudson Valley. Um, prior to working here at the Justice Center, um, I'm a retired detective commander from the City of White Plains Police Department in Westchester County. Uh, I did 31 years of service, as I said, retiring as a detective commander. Uh, so I do have um, very vast knowledge on photography, um, how important photography is and how important it is to our cases. And then subsequently later on to our um, prosecution and or uh, hearings that we have. I am joined today by investigator Maura Gagan, uh, I'll let Maura introduce herself. Good afternoon, Maura. Good afternoon, Chief, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, again, my name is Maura Gagan. I am an investigator out of the Brooklyn office, which is Region 4, which covers the New York City and Long Island area of New York. Um, and prior to this, I uh, retired out of the Los Angeles Police Department as a detective, and I'm very honored to be uh, presenting here today with Chief. So thank you for having me. Excellent. Thank you, Maura. So to begin, um, we're going to jump in to our first poll question, uh, which is going to be, have you used a camera before to collect evidence for an investigation? We'll give everybody a little bit of time to complete it. All right, if you could just wrap it up, there uh, we go. Okay, so just the answers to our, our poll question. We've had about 64% of you have stated that, yes, you have used a camera to document evidence before, and 36% have said no. So this course will be beneficial to each and every one of you, um, whether you've used a camera before or whether you have not. I think we've done a pretty good job with putting all of uh, a, a comprehensive program together for you today. All right, so we have some objectives for today. Um, we're going to go over each of these in, in some detail. Uh, what's the purpose of investigative photography? Why is it important? We're going to cover that. We're going to cover admissibility. How do we get our photographs to be used in a hearing or to be used in court. Um, we're going to go over some basic principles of photography. We're going to talk uh, in detail about three basic photographic types, different types of photographs that we're going to use for our investigations. We're going to introduce, and probably to many of you, we're going to introduce the use of scales, what a scale is, why it's important, um, why we're going to introduce it into our photographs. We're going to talk about photographing injuries. 
what we should be doing with photographing injuries, what we should be looking for, and what we should be making sure that our photographs contain when we're, inter when we're photographing injuries. We're going to touch on bloodstain photography. Now, I know that probably many of us don't have too many bloodstains um, that we photograph, but it could also be very effective in using, and I'll give the credit to Maura here on this one. Uh, she's had a couple of cases where she photographed oil or things of that, of a liquid nature that were splattered across a room or a kitchen. So uh, the blood stain photography, we address that. We're going to talk briefly about motor vehicle photography. What are some of the important things we should be looking at? Uh, when we photograph a motor vehicle, we should be what angles we should be looking at, what important features of the vehicle we should be photographing. Uh, and then we're going to also talk about authentication. How do we authenticate the nature of the photographs? So we have a very comprehensive program for you this afternoon. So what is the purpose of our investigation photography? What is the purpose of utilizing photographs? So a couple of things here, it records details of the scene and the surrounding areas. We're going to be able to photograph a facility, maybe a location of a restraint, the condition of a wheelchair, the presence of an injury that may be of unknown origin, we want to document the appearance of injuries. We want to be able to show a true and accurate representation of what the injuries look like at the time that we're taking the photos. We want to provide investigators, witnesses, and others with a permanent visual record of the incident, of the injury, of the scene, of the location. And then Later, we're going to use this photography or our photographs in, to enable us to refresh our memory of the incident or of the injury. It also allows us to review scene details. You take a photograph of the scene as it was when you're taking the photograph, <clears throat> we're able to go back as many times as we want to review what the photographs show, what the scene looked like. If you have a question about something, well, I wonder if the door was open or if the door was closed. We can go back and take a look at the photograph to see. Was the window open? Was it closed? We can go back and take a look at our photographs and be able to refresh our recollection of what the scene looked like. We want to, it provides evidence to be used for comparison purposes. Injured areas versus non-injured areas. Many times documenting the absence of injury is just as important as documenting an, an observable injury. We may also want to use document, we also may want to document the progression of a healing injury. Many times injuries take a day, two, or three days to fully come out on skin. So we may want to document that progression. And we want to be able to strengthen our investigative reports utilizing our photographs. We want to be able to use that to convey information at a hearing or a trial or things of that nature. Let's talk a little bit about admissibility. The three points of qualification for photographs. The first is it must be relative to the issues of the case. We're taking photographs for specific reasons. We're taking photographs to depict certain things and they must be relative to the issues of the case. They must be true and accurate representations of the scene or of the particular injury that we are photographing. 
And third, they must have a probative value. And that probative value must outweigh prejudicial effects of the photograph. When we're looking at a photograph or taking a photograph, we want to make sure that it, it's probative in value. We want to make sure it's it adds to our case. So we have some basic principles that we'd like to discuss. Some guidelines as they were. Take photographs prior to collecting evidence. No evidence should ever be removed until it is photographed in its location. In case evidence is damaged during the collection process, the evidence is preserved through photographic documentation. Our photographs should always be taken prior to moving or collecting any evidence. I'm going to turn this next section over to my colleague, Maura. Good afternoon, Maura. Thanks, Chief. Um, so we're going to talk about camera setup here. And the, some of the stuff might seem basic, but it, it down the line, it, it's going to um, mean a lot when, when we look at investigations and hearings or whether we go to court with these cases. First and foremost, review the instruction booklet. And if you don't understand the instruction booklet or how, this, how to set up the camera, you know, our, our, our thought process is it's a talk to the supervisor, your supervisor. Um, why there's a little asterisk on the next one, ensure the date and time are accurate. Um, and Chief will touch on this at the end of this. It's, it's crucial that the date and time are accurate for these photos of when they're being, when they're being taken. Um, we want you to ensure that you know how to download and save photos. Um, again, uh, it's just gonna make your job easier. And this last one is in red and it's in red for a reason. And, and um, we recommend that you never use your cell phone or personal phone or work cell phone um, to take photos. And uh, we mentioned this because your work phone can be used to review all contents during hearing. And once it becomes known, a personal work phone was used uh, for photos, um, it could become an issue. And I know Chief Fisher wants to touch upon this. Thank you, Mara. Yeah, the, in, in my prior career, um, a couple of times I have seen where a detective used his personal phone or his cell or his work issued cell phone to take photographs of a crime scene of a specific incident or location. And we have to turn that information over to counsel. We have to let them know that photographs were taken on a cell phone, personal and or work. At that point, the phone itself becomes evidence and can become evidentiary in value, in nature. They can seize the phone. They can go through the phone. They can go through everything in the phone because the defense's argument is going to be that there could be exculpatory information on that phone because if you took a photograph of a particular piece of evidence, or if you took a photograph of a particular injury or of a location, then their, their argument is going to be that there could be other information on that phone, whether it be a photograph or other information that could prove the innocence of their client. So I have seen it where phones have been seized. So please, uh, cameras are issued for a reason, please use them. And then this way you never have the issue of having your work or personal cell phones confiscated for an investigation. And Maura mentioned something else about ensure that date and time are accurate. To me, this is a little bit of a pet peeve for me, but it shows professionalism. It shows um, accuracy. If you, if you, bring forward a photograph that has January 1st, 1999 on the, the, the camera. First, it doesn't look professional. Second, it's not accurate. And third, a defense attorney could use that to say that the photographs can't be used because they are not an accurate representation of when and where the photograph was taken. So just make sure that that 
as Maura said, that when you set your camera up, that everything is set up the way it should be. And the, um, the date, time, et cetera, are accurate. Thanks so much, Chief. Can you move to the next one? So what we're gonna talk about here now is how to take effective photos. And um, some of the recommendations we came up with is become fully familiar with the location, whether this is a residence or a day program or something else. Um, if we're talking about in the actual uh, injury, excuse me, take a look at the in injury and you know, decide what type of photos you wanna take. We also talked about before, um, also taking photos of the non-injured area. We're gonna get more in depth as the slides go through. And also consider taking a series from overall to close up of uh, what you're actually gonna be photographing. Again, that could be an injury, it could be a location. Um, and you want, one of the key points here is you wanna orient the viewer to the scene. What are we actually looking at? Um, do we actually, are we actually looking at, again, an injury or a location or um, potentially a vehicle on a public street? So we wanna make sure the viewer, whoever it may be, knows what they're actually looking at. Um, take the photos. Um, you don't wanna later on, you know, think, hey, I should have took this photo. So we recommend of, um, developing a consistent routine. I'm going to turn this back over to Chief, and we're going to move over to the Justice Center reference card. Thank you, Maura. The Before you do that, Chief, I just um, I have one question uh, mm -hmm. following up on your cell phone uh, directive. Does that apply for um, non-criminal situations? Can investigators, if they're doing something, you know, if the provider agency is investigating, can they use a cell phone? Well, what they can do is if it goes to a, whether it's a... Um, whether it's a criminal matter or a hearing, uh, the defense attorney could absolutely make the argument that they need to see what else is on the photograph uh, on the phone, and they could absolutely for a for a hearing uh, that that we all have been a part of, they could absolutely make an appeal to the uh, ALJ that it's it's important that that we look at the the phone to see what other information is on there. So I would say absolutely um, for hearings as well, it could absolutely be. Because every subject of a Justice Center investigation has the ability to appeal um, a substantiated finding. So, um, and I wanna clarify that this training is meant for both providers and Justice Center investigators, but we're obviously this is um, intended for our um, outside entities. So this is appropriate for providers if that's who you are. And one last question, and then I'll let you um, get back into your flow. Um, are there rules and regulations that people should review um, surrounding consent for photos of individuals or injuries? Well, uh, consent is usually um, when when we get called to an investigation, we're we're conducting that investigation, and part of the investigation is to take photos of injuries, documenting what injuries are. Um, so, I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with asking for consent to take the photos. Um, but it is something that we absolutely need for our investigation. So, and, and we have very strict um, laws governing, you know, what information that we have that can ever be shared um, with people. We have to respect people's private health information, um, you know, HIPAA rules for us too. So it's not like this, these photos go out and they end up on the World Wide Web. That's the last question. Continue on, please. Thank you, Davin. So just to touch on uh, Maura's last point, the, the development of a consistent routine I found is always effective. Um, when you develop a routine into how you're gonna photograph things, um, you tend not to omit things. You tend to be able to be focused on what you need to do and how you need to depict uh, what you're photographing. So um, excellent point, Maura, for developing a consistent routine. So as we progress forward, um, the card that you're seeing on your screen now is a um, Justice Center reference card. This is not exclusive for the Justice Center. This is a card uh, that is widely available in most um, evidentiary or evidence uh, companies. 
Um, and basically, this should be used as the first image in your photographic accounting of the incident. It provides very basic information, but it shows consistency, it shows professionalism, and it answers all the questions that you're going to want to know about the photographs taken for your specific case. Obviously, the date and time, what, the, what your agency is, what your agency case number is, and probably one of the more important things, who took the photograph. So if you use this as a initial photograph with all that information, all the photographs afterwards, you know, are going to be tied to this particular case. We're going to talk about logging your photos. So in order to log your photos, and the reason you want to log your photographs is it ensures purpose and subject matter of each photograph. And that everybody understands what the photograph is, what the subject matter is, and what the purpose of that photograph is. It assists investigators with recall for later on. And every photo taken must be recorded, even those taken by mistake. This falls under the same premise as using your cell phone to take photographs. Even if the photograph is taken by mistake, even if the photograph is blurry. Um, throughout the course of my career, both of my careers, I've taken many photographs of the inside of my jacket pocket um, the bottom of my shoes, the top of my shoes. Um, and as embarrassing as it may be, we need to show consistency with our photographs. And we need to show that these are all the photographs that were taken. It's much easier, better, and more professional to explain why you took a photograph of the inside of your jacket pocket, um, as opposed to trying to justify why there's a missing photograph in your photographic documentation. So I'm going to turn this section over to Maura. Maura? Thanks, Chief. So we're gonna discuss now documenting photos when, when um, you're taking them in your investigations. The first thing we're gonna talk about is using proper nomenclature to denote the photos. And an example we used in uh, Everyone might use different types of nomenclature. For this example, we use photo one, and depending on how many photos, you might even go down to photo 1A or 1Z. So it just depends how you folks want to actually document your photos. Um, the, one of the really key points here in the middle is please describe the photo and what it depicts and the date and time, again, making sure that it's accurate and where the photo was taken. And again, just a, a brief, um, you know, synopsis here is a photo one of victim Smith taken on 8 20, 2001, uh, 21. Full name and title, and it's depicting a two inch round bruise on the inside of the left bicep. And the last thing is if, if a photo log was done, and we're going to get more into this as we uh, progress through this PowerPoint, um, we'd ask you to send that photo log to us. Again, as Chief touched upon before, um, this really just shows professionalism and uh, will really succinct both the photos and the log together when it will need to be utilized down the line. Um, Chief, do you have anything on that? No, it's the, the photographs this way. Um, it also helps with recollection of what photographs you've taken. Um, when you're discussing this case, possibly with your supervisor or another investigator, um, and somebody says, oh, uh, did you take a photograph of this? You'll be able to say, oh, yeah, I think I do have a photograph of that. You'll be able to go right to the photographic log and, and just quickly look down and say, oh, yep, I have a photograph of that, and here it is. And it, it really works excellently with photographic evidence. You're able to keep everything succinct, in order, professional, as, as we've always said, professional, and it shows everything and in this day and age, it's all about transparency and you're gonna have everything right there 
in front of you. Thanks. I have a, just a couple quick questions um, from the audience. One is, um, you know, people receiving services can refuse to have um, a photo taken of their injuries. Do you have any suggestions um, when that happens for a provider agency? Maura, I'm going to turn that over to you uh, as one that's actually in the field taking the photographs of, uh, of service recipients. You know, I think, honestly, every situation is going to be different. And um, I think I, I would defer to each and every investigator on here that you're going to use your best judgment, excuse me, in taking those photos. And if it comes to the point where you're going to potentially upset somebody, you may want to weigh those options at that time and come back uh, potentially later even in the day. Thank you. Um, and then is the Justice Center reference card that you referenced earlier, you know, to get the size of the wound, um, is that available to provider agencies? Without a doubt. You can go on. Uh, there's several different um, evidence companies that are out there. Uh, one that jumps to mind is Searchy. The name of the company is Searchy, S-I-R-C-H-I-E. Uh, it's an evidence um Company based company that has all sorts of of evidence equipment, um, and these these photographic cards are extremely common. Great, thank you. So we're going to jump into our next poll question. And that is, what types of photographs do not have to be logged and documented? What types of photographs do not have to be logged and documented? Our choices are photos taken by mistake. Blurry photos, duplicate photos, none of the above. Couple more minutes, couple more minutes. All right, we should be wrapping up. All right, so are the answers. We had 5% said photos taken by mistake, 2% blurry, 8% duplicate, and overwhelming 85%, none of the above. And that is the correct answer. None of the above. All photographs have to be logged and documented, even mistake, photos taken by mistake, blurry and or duplicate, they all have to be logged and documented. So thank you for participating in our second poll question. So we're going to get into our, our three basic types of photographs. And there are three basic types of photographs that we are going to use when we photograph things. The first thing is our overall photograph. And this is a, an overall photograph used for an outdoor purpose. It establishes an overall view of the incident location and sometimes possible potential evidence that may be included in that. 
For the outdoor scene, the photograph landmark photograph landmarks to establish exact location of incident scene, vehicular accident that may have caused an injury, and we want to photograph in different angles. So if you look at this photograph and we were investigating something that occurred inside that building, this is a good overall photograph of the incident location so that there's no question on what we're doing um, where we are and where the incident occurred. For an overall photograph uh, indoors, uh, this is a excellent representation of an office. And if, if this incident occurred inside that cubicle right there, this is a great photograph of what the overall picture of where the incident occurred is. Later on, if we ever need to come back to this office, we can compare it to the photograph and see exactly where the incident occurred. You wanna be able to show all four corners of the room so that everyone has a good layout of the incident location. You may wanna consider using a wide angle lens so that you get a complete coverage of the incident location. Uh, it may not be available. Some cameras may not have it, uh, whatever the case is. But if you do have it, this may be a, a good area to use the wide angle lens. We're gonna talk about long range photos or long range overall location photos. Uh, two sets of overall photos can be taken. Uh, we can do prior to the introduction of any markers and after the introduction of evident marker, evidence markers if applicable. We're gonna talk a little bit more about evidence markers um, shortly, but we wanna be able to um, show the overall place that we're looking to photograph. Um, overlapping photographs to make a connection between images may be an option as well if the area is too large. Um, again, this can be used in documenting a larger area of a facility, maybe a gymnasium, a courtyard, common hallway, lunchroom, drop-off point for transport vehicles, things of that nature. In our photograph here, we're showing outdoor location. Um, we see a playground on the right-hand side. We see a subject standing on the left-hand side in between the trees. And we see a bicycle that's on the ground uh, in between the other two trees that are there. Um, we have some cars in the background behind the playground. And we have another subject that's currently on the playground itself. This just shows an overall view of your incident location. It gives some permanent landmarks so that we can, if we need to go back to the scene later, we can match it up with our photographs using the use of, of the different landmarks. Our mid-range photos, it can establish a location of potential evidence. You wanna have some obvious landmarks again, so that we can really hone in on what we're looking for. Um, your evidence may, be, may become more readily identifiable. When we're looking at it, now we're getting a little bit closer up. We're still showing a little bit of an overall view, a mid-range view, but we're able to, sh to show where the evidence may be. It's also going to help in transitioning the viewer from the long range to the mid range so that you're, you're, you can see the overall and then we're starting to narrow it down to get more specific. So here's some, some comparison photographs. On the left, we have our long range as we saw earlier. And the second photograph on the right, we're showing a little bit more mid range more close up view here of, of what we're looking at. 
And then we're going to jump into a close-up photograph. This is going to do a few things. Your close-up photograph should clearly identify the evidence that you're looking for. It should be used to establish the exact location of where your evidence is. You want to fill the entire frame of your camera uh, with the item of evidence and a marker if you so choose to use a marker. Close-ups should be photographed with and without a scale, and we're going to get into a scale very shortly. And you always want to try and photograph evidence at a 90 degree angle. This will help prevent distortion of the photograph or of the evidence of, or of the scale or of the terrain. Um, if you use it, if you take a photo at a 90 degree angle, that is the best and most preferred method of photographing evidence. So here we have just a comparison for our outdoor overall mid-range and close-up comparison. We have that mid-range that shows us, you know, the, the playground, and we have a, a close-up comparison um, showing the slide here, if that is our piece of evidence. So you can see how we go from that overall view to a more close-up view of what we're looking for. The left side photo, also a couple things of note, demonstrates more details. We have a stop sign here. We have a child in a t-shirt. We have some vehicles over here, one with a convertible top, if you, if you look hard enough. Um, and the, the right side demonstrates a more specifically, you can see the park bench more clearly. Um, you can see the actual swing set where on the left photo, you don't actually see it because it's too far away, um, and an up-close view of the slide. Maura? Thanks, Chief. So now what we're going to discuss, and we, we're just going to like do a compilation what Chief just went over. So as far as like the overall, where we thought like a ballpark would just show that overall. We look at that mid-range, we have that batter's box with the chalk outline and the home base plate. And then we look up the close-up with the home base plate and uh, the baseball. So this just kind of just ties everything up for you folks when we're just talking about the progressive type photos. Chief, if you could move on to the next one, please. And so this one here now, we have the progression of the vehicle. Um, again, from the overall, if we're going from left to right, we have the red vehicle, driver's side window, um, window appears to be down a little bit. We're looking at that mid-range one in the middle. You can see some clearly uh, marks notes on there, marking where there's um, fingerprints. And on the close-up now is going to be like the first introduction we're showing of a scale. Um, and Chief and I have both agreed these are the most perfect fingerprints we've, we've ever seen, picked up on something. Um, but this scale is what Chief referred to as before on that angle of um, illuminating the fingerprints um, on, on that window. Um, Chief, do you have anything on this? Yeah, just, just to touch more on what you said, um, that is a right angle um, scale. Um, it's, not, it's used for a couple of different things. Um, it shows the exact location. It highlights the exact location of the evidence that you're photographing. It also measures them for you so that you have a scale, you have a measuring device right there. So you know exactly how, um, what the dimensions are of the fingerprints that you're photographing. And those little circles with the plus signs in the middle, those are used to show that the photograph was taken at the proper 90 degree angle. If the view was different, if the camera angle was different on that, those circles would not be symmetrical. So that's just a little um, warm up to when we, when we get into the use of scales. But those, those 90 degree angle scales are, again, very, very widely accessible. Um, like I said, Searchy carries them. Uh, most evidence equipment places carry them um, and they're, uh, they're very, very effective. 
Thanks, Chief. And some of the last points on, on this compilation of slides we show, change the point of view, change, change up the point of view of your photographs. Take photographs from different perspectives to provide that you know, those photographic useful information will, will become down the line for your investigative report or if it eventually does go to a hearing. Um, we, again, we talked about uh, the inclusion of evidence markers. Again, Chief and I you know, have both thought about including this because you can get them on evidence-based uh, collection websites. So they are out there if in fact you folks do wanna use them. What this, what this does again is it, you can get that overall medium and close-up photos and it aids the viewer in the recognition and location and the orientation of evidence. So that's why we wanted to include those um, in this presentation. And I think we're moving towards a poll question. Yes, thank you, Maura. Our next poll question, um, which of these photos types is used to establish the exact location of the incident or injury? Mid-range, close-up, or long-range? Which of these photo types is used to establish the exact location of the incident or injury? Mid-range, close-up, or long-range? Now we'll give everybody another few seconds to finish up. Okay, and our answers, we have 29% at mid-range, 39% at close-up, and 32% at long-range. The correct answer for this is the exact location of the incident or injury, we're going to use a close-up on the exact location of the incident or injury. So... I appreciate the answer. Um, and I have a question for you. Yeah, Chief. please, Deb. Um, since you know provider organizations aren't doing criminal investigations, a question came up. Um, you know, is photographic evidence necessary for every investigation? And say, for example, what kinds of photos would be helpful if the allegation is a you know breach of supervision? Well, I'm going to turn this over to Maura, and then I'll I'll chime in after, but turn it over to uh, Maura. Well, right off the bat with a breach of supervision, um, I'm just going to give an example here. Let's just say that an individual got outside of a residence and wound up on a public street somewhere near a corner store or something. It would definitely be helpful uh, to see where this person was actually located, um, potentially what was in the area, uh, hazardous, not only in a public area, but maybe hypothetically there's construction going on. Maybe the, the, the street's being worked on. Maybe it's near a subway station. So just with that, with the breach of supervision, um, for me, if I was looking at it, if I got that case, I would want to see where the person actually ended up um, and um, the, the potential, uh, that long range you could get from the house if it is an eyesight view um, and, and potentially where the the person receiving services was located by a staff member. 
So although sometimes people may not think photos are for like a breach of supervision, I myself uh, would, would use that down the line. Um, Chief, I'm going to turn it back over to you. That's a great point, Maura. And also to just double on that, um, if there are door alarms or window alarms or things of that nature that, um, that are supposed to be in place or intact, you know, you may want to take a photograph of that uh, as well to show what the condition of um, the equipment that is at a location uh, to show what the condition of that equipment would be. So I, I think to, to go along with Mara's point that each, each individual case is different and you need to look at the totality of it. And photographs are definitely um, a way to show um, how things looked when, when you had gotten there. So like I said, if, if they had window alarms and, and the, the, the person receiving services got out through the window, well, what were the conditions of those windows alarms, uh, the window alarms? Were they even on? Were they not activated? Were, and, a, and a quick photograph of that will definitely enhance your case. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome back from the break. While Chief Fisher pulls up the um, second half of the PowerPoint, a couple of questions, a couple of questions came in during the break. Um, so the first one was, um, with the example more that you used of, you know, using a photograph for the breach of supervision, you know, taking the pictures outside, uh, would it ever be appropriate to use um, a Google Maps photo? And if so, how would the investigator document that? That's a good question. Um, I would honestly defer to your own agency's policy of that, if there even one is in existence. Um, I've used them in investigations, but that's gone through supervision and supervisory review of me to uh, using them in investigations. Um, but to be on the safe side, I would defer to supervision of whatever particular agency you're with. Thank you. Um, the, there was another question, if investigators, if you don't recommend using work phones to take pictures, what should somebody use to take a picture? Well, clearly it would be the agency issued camera would be the preferred method for it. Thank you. Sure. Um, and then there was a question uh, if, you know, when sometimes a provider may get assigned a case a couple days after um, an incident has, has occurred, are photographs helpful then? Are there photographs that can be taken at the time of the incident? I imagine it's case specific, but uh, yeah, Davin, you're 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 correct. It would be it would be uh, case specific, but um, especially if you're looking to document a, an injury, um, especially an injury that may not be so pronounced. Um, you know, two or three days later, the injury could uh, disappear. So you, you really have to take it as a, as a case by case basis. But, you know, photographing a location, photographing uh, different things, um, you, you can absolutely do it a couple of days later, but you really need to. And, and what I'll go back to is one of our initial slides with what's the probative nature of that photograph? Is it going to, does it show a true and accurate representation of what you're looking for? And if the answer to that question is no, then you may not want to take that photo. Thank you. And then I just want to um, emphasize to people who may have joined later, uh, the PowerPoint will be available. It will be sent out to participants after the conclusion of the Justice Center Summit which ends tomorrow. And um, we will have these up on our website, um, not you know right away, but hopefully in the next week or so, so that uh, people can refer back to it and use it for training staff if they would like. That's it for now, thank you. Thank you, Davin. All right, so now we're gonna get into, um, welcome back from the break, if I should say first. Um, and now we're gonna get into the use of scales. Um, I know this may be a new territory for a lot of people, but we're going to go over some uh, what scales are, what they're used for, uh, what some of the scales look like, um, just to give you an idea. So to begin, the value of scales. 
Scales are important because one of the first things that it does for you, it establishes the size of the evidence found at the scene. The, if a knife is found, you can have a very clear representation of it with your photograph. And when you introduce a, a scale, you're going to be able to see exactly how long the handle is, exactly how long the blade is. Um, so it, it absolutely uh, is, is valuable for establishing the size of the evidence. It also aids with, the, um, with examinations if evidence is forensically compared. If we're looking for a size nine shoe and the shoe print that we took a photograph of and used a scale on is, shows a size 10, we know that and we'll be able to do we'll be able to know that through the use of the scale. Make sure that your scales include a unit of measure in the scale that's utilized. Some scales don't, um, but just make sure that it includes the unit of measurement. Maura? Hey, thanks, Chief. So these are some of the guidelines for using a scale. Um, Place the scale as close to the object in question without compromising the integrity of the question. And essentially what that means is you want the scale as close to, let's just say hypothetically a footprint, as close as possible with not, without being on top of what you're actually trying to measure with that scale. Um, utilize a scale as close to the length of the object uh, being photographed and position the scale in the same plane as the subject being photographed. And Chief, if you can just move to that next slide, I think this is just going to make uh, more sense for um, everybody on here. Um, again, th this is going to be the proper use of a scale. Um, again, this is like the most f perfect footprint I think anyone's ever seen in, in the ground to capture this. But the, the, the scale is placed in uh, as it's not, uh, you know, compromising the integrity of that footprint. It's close to the footprint. And once again, as we talked to before, it's positioned on that same plane. And Chief, if you could move to the next one. That and also just, yep, oh, just, yes, one, uh, just one note also, when we're looking at this particular shoe print here, um, it, is the, it is long enough to measure the entire width and length of the, photo, of the piece of evidence that you're looking for. And that's important as well. You want, it to, you want to be able to look at your photograph with the scale in and be able to um, measure it looking at it. So this is absolutely 100% perfect use of scale. Thanks, Chief. That was uh, a great addition. I appreciate it. Um, what we're looking at right now uh, is an incorrect use of the scale. And some of the, some of the issues that we see with this, it's not on the same plane as that footprint and um, it's out of focus. And we can't actually ascertain the length and the width of it because the scale is positioned incorrectly. And uh, again, it's just out of focus. And down the line, um, this is gonna cause issues if this, you know, not particularly this particular photo, but a photo that any one of us could take in the future of us even trying to recollect what it was. So um, if you just keep those um, thoughts in mind as far as keeping it in focus and on the same plane, um, that'll serve you well in the future. Back so let's get into um, photographing. I just, I have one quick question. Sure, Dan. Sure. It's a follow-up. Um, so uh, you mentioned before that provider agencies should use, you know, a, a camera to take pictures. Do you have any recommendation about the type of camera? Should it be digital? Should it be film? I, I think it's up to your individual provider or what, what they think. Uh, I don't... Uh, for me, I think a, the, a digital camera, I think, is easier to use. Um, it's the images are more easily stored and saved. And um, so my suggestion would be a, uh, a, a digital camera. Maura, any, uh, any suggestions? I 100% agree. I think digital uh, at this time, if, if your agency is going to invest in one, um, it's going to serve you well down the line, you know, one of the problems with uh, 35 millimeters is depreciation of photos over time. Um, with digital photos, you're going to have that uh, log that you can create online. Um, 
So you're just not going to have those depreciation issues with um, regular foam photos. Thank you. And um, just one last thing that I'll clarify. Um, when we're talking about, you know, agencies having, you know, cameras available and using those, we're recommending best practices. We are, these are not requirements. The Justice Center, you know, does not issue requirements for provider agencies. So these are best practices based on our experiences, um, right? Anything else you want to add to that, Chief Fisher or Maura? Thank you, Devin. I appreciate that. And uh, yeah, we, I probably, and I apologize. I probably should have started the presentation with that. Um, but thank you for pointing that out, Devin. I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Carry on. Okay, so we're going to get into photographing injuries now. Um, the injuries that we have depicted here are not too graphic, so um, don't uh, don't be alarmed. Um, they they're they're not overly graphic. We really did a Maura did a great job with establishing that. Um, but we're going to talk about a couple of different things that we've spoken about in depth. And the first thing we're going to talk about is some recommended tools. So we already talked about the photo ledger. As you can see from that photo ledger, it, it contains the date, time, agency, case number, and photo taken by. You also have a color bar on there, um, which is right under photo taken. You have a the photo bar so if there's a question about color of something, you have something to compare it to. Uh, you have a unit of measurement on the left and a grayscale um, on, the, on the right. So that photo ledger really contains just about everything that you're, you're, you would need. Um, the correct scale that you're looking at in the middle uh, is a unit of measurement. It also has the um, distortion circles on there. Uh, it even breaks it down into cent centimeters, millimeters, uh, as well as inches. So that is a very common, commonly used uh, scale um, and one that is, again, very easily accessible. And then on the right-hand side, we have the photographic log. And basically, it is a very simple document to fill out. Um, all the pertinent information that is needed for any specific particular case. Um, and it gives you really free hand as to exactly what information you want to detail on there. So these three tools are 100% what, what, what we would recommend best practices um, for photographing um, scenes, injuries, locations, and evidence. So some best, best practices. Um, you want to take a full-scale photo of the injured person. In my experience, this has been the most common mistake made by investigators, that they do a great job at photographing the specific injury, but there's no identifiable photographs that are taken of the individual. So the first thing we want to do is take a full-scale photo of the injured person so that we know who we are referring to when we talk about the injury and or victim. We want to take an overall photograph of the wound injury with identifying characteristics of the victim so that when we're looking at the injury, we can immediately attribute it to our victim with one photograph. We want to use a mid-range photo to show the general area of the injury and then a close-up of the injury with and without the use of a scale. We're going to show you an example of that uh, shortly, but these are what we consider the best practices for, injure, for, for photographing injuries. Some more of our best practices, sometimes we want to vary the perspective so that you can get a different angle of the injury, get a different view of the injury. Um, we want to use the camera's recommended exposure. I'm going to have uh, more a touch on that in a second. Uh, bracketing will ensure proper color balance. Uh, we want to ensure accurate representation of the injury. Um, we're going to, we want to use the standardized color bar. We don't want to change anything. 
um, and we want to photograph the injury with an anatomic landmark. And what that means is that when we take a photograph of the injury, we want to have some ana uh, anatomic landmark on the victim so that it's very easy to identify the body part and where the, that is located. So Maura, if you could just talk about the, ex the exposures and the, uh, the, col the standardized color bars and things like that for, um, for people that may not be familiar with that. Sure, so when we're talking about the exposures, I just wanna kind of combine them together, exposure and bracketing. Um, I, have a, I have a couple of different of my own cameras um, that I use uh, myself, but basically now in, in 2022, if you put a camera on a, an automatic setting, it, it's normally going to, what, it, what is kind of called reading the room. Um, if you're not familiar with, with cameras, the best practice is to kind of leave that on the auto setting, but cameras come with huge manuals. So, you know, the best practice would be, again, as we said in the beginning, to f familiarize yourself with those uh, manual of the camera. And, um, you know, if, if you are unsure, the best practice would be to, um, you know, shoot those photos on, on auto to, to, to pick that up because uh, the cameras in 2022 are so sensitive. And the, as far as the standardized color bar that we talked about before, it, you know, you can just place that near and around that injury again, not disturbing the injury and not covering the injury just to see, um, you know, that there's going to be no distortion and, and it can pick up on like as a similar color to what the injury potentially looks like. So that's what that means. Um, these are some some more like high level stuff. We just want to include it. Then we're just trying to be as comprehensive as possible. And I, I hope that makes sense. And I hope I uh, described it in the easiest way possible. Thank you, Maura. I appreciate that. Um, and when we're using a scale, we want to make sure that we're placing the scale directly above or below the injury to ensure accurate representation of the size and the depth of the injury. So we're going to show you examples coming up very shortly on um, incorrect use of scales and photographs and correct use of scales and photographs. So some considerations here, um, position scale on the same plane, as I said, uh, utilize different flash techniques to capture details. You don't wanna get that white out or that flash out. Um, so, so there may be an incident where you want to remove the flash. Um, you wanna photograph both the injured area and a non-injured area. Uh, for example, if the, if the person receiving services has an injury to his left cheek, you may wanna take a photograph of the right cheek for comparison purposes. Uh, you wanna collect photos over time to show progression of the injury if applicable to your specific case. Maura? Thanks, Chief. So what we're gonna do now is look at a series of photos and um, you guys, uh, all of you can place your answers in the chat box. I'm just going to ask some questions and just get some feedback from, from everybody that's on here today. I'm just a little more interactive. Um, I want you folks to think about, is this in injury accurately documented? Um, is, the scale, is there a scale uh, to measure these injuries? Um, what's missing? Is there anything in this photo that could have been done better? Um, some things maybe to think about, more photos, other angles, range of photo photos. And do we even know what body part this is? Um, so if you could just take a, take a minute and just um, you know, provide some answers um, and we'll go from there. I'm looking at the chat box. These are, uh, folks, this is great feedback. Um, I'm not gonna go over everything, but the, the feedback that's coming in um, is fantastic. And uh, Chief and I and everyone else on here really appreciates everyone's uh, interaction with us. 
Just so you know more, and nobody else can see um, what's in the chat except for okay. us. So if you want to give a couple examples. Sure. Thanks, David. Um, photograph is missing scale. Is this an elbow? There's no scale. Should have been a full, full body along with it. Um, not sure what the body part. These are all um, fantastic answers um, to this one. Um, Chief, you want to move on to the next one, sir? Sure, and I'm just going to throw my little comment in here. And this this photograph to me is an excellent example of, and and, and I'm very very happy to hear that everybody's been. A lot of people have been uh, chatting in that they're unsure what body part this is. And for me, uh, that to me, the first time I looked at this, I thought it was a um, a finger. I thought it was the knuckle of a finger, and because, you know, did they use, you know, uh, did they did they zoom in on this photograph, which could distort exactly what the image is. So I appreciate all we appreciate all these comments. And that is a huge thing looking at this. And, and the first question to I think to anyone that looks at it, you, you look at this and you say, what body part is this? How can we realistically use this photograph moving forward when we can't even identify what the body part is. Thanks, Jay. Okay, so looking at photo two here now, I um, want everyone to think about, again, in the chat box, is this photo accurately documented? Uh, is there a scale in the measure in the photo to measure the injuries and is it being used properly? What could have been done better? Um, so we'd, we'd love to get your feedback. Um, so feel free to put it in the chat box. And I'm just going to read a couple of here. There's a date and time. Uh, lighting seems to be off. Scale doesn't cover the full range of the injury. That's an excellent one. Um, scale should be further to the left. Unknown body part. Um, folks, this is all uh, great. Chief, do you have anything on this photo? No, the same. I, I, I think the observation of it, it's not uh, in line with the entire um, injury, I think, is an excellent observation um, because it's not. And that that distorts the nature of the injury. So is this an accurate, a true and accurate representation of it? No, because it's an incorrect use of the scale. And agreed, another one, what body part is this? I, I don't think anybody can really honestly look at this and, and give a definitive answer as to what the body part is. So excellent, excellent um, responses. And this is going to be the last photo today. Um, again, we'd love to get your feedback in the chat box. Uh, is this injury, injury actually uh, accurately documented? What could have been done better? Um, just, just, just put your answers out there and uh, we can check out your feedback. There's some really good answers here about resolution, and you're absolutely right about the resolution of this. Can't read the scale. Um, uh, there's great one. Um, each individual inju uh, injury should have been a use of a scale. Um, cannot read scale. Missing a mid-range. Chief, you have any uh, follow-up on this one, sir? And when I look at this photo, the thing that jumps out to me is this is a, a perfect example of the need for two photographs, the need for one with the scale and one without the scale. And the reason I, we bring that up is because the first question that comes to my mind is because there's multiple injuries here, are there any injuries that are underneath the scale? 
And that's why this is a perfect example where there should be one photograph without the scale so that you could see all of the injuries and then see the one with the scale. So um, just things to, to take into consideration. Um, you know, I think we're, we can all assume that this is the subject's back. But again, we don't want, when we take our photographs, we don't want to make any assumptions. Thank you everyone for participating. Hi, a question came in. Um, what's the proper way to photograph more sensitive areas? Should those be avoided with regard to photos? Again, I'm going to, to defer to the individual investigator and the individual case. Um, Yes, we, we, we all know that there could be injuries that are in sensitive areas. And, you know, I would definitely consult with your supervisor before any of those photographs are taken um, and go from there. If we're taking, uh, if, if there is a need to take photographs of sensitive areas, I think that then at that point, this would more than likely be a police investigation. There would be um, hospital uh, uh, nurses involved or uh, child advocacy centers that are involved um, and things of that nature. So I, I would defer from that, but have a discussion with your individual supervisor before those decisions are made. Maura, any uh Right, I, I agree, sir, the, that the best practice is um, to talk to supervision about that and, uh, you know, develop a plan from there. Each one of these investigations is, is going to be so different and injuries of sensitive areas are going to be so different and the circumstances, how they were obtained are going to be different. So there, I don't think there's just going to be one clear solution to that with each, inve which, you know, every investigation that could possibly be out there. Thank you. One more question and then I will... Um... I will step back for a few minutes. Um, what can a family member do, say when you know a person receiving services goes home, the family member says they took a picture right when they came home of an injury, but by the time the person returns to the program, there's no evidence of the injury. If I read the question correctly, um, I, I think that, that w when, when the allegation is made or uh, when they notify the agency of the injury, um, I think that that photograph should be forwarded um, to the individual investigator uh, for, for documentation purposes. Um, we're not doing this course, unfortunately, for family members, but so I would just take the photograph, make it part of your case, and you know we'll move forward from there. And, and as I said, um, we, we keep going back to the fact that it's going to be um, up to the individual agencies as to uh, their collection of, of evidence and things like that. Maura, anything? Uh, I agree. Um, you know, one, a, a thought or a you know, possible best practice of that, too, is um, having a track of how it was sent. Um, either, you know, via email where it is trackable, date and time it was sent, who sent it, and, you know, what investigator that was sent to for authentication purposes. Yeah, we're going to, thank you, Maura, that's a great point. We're going to talk about authentication uh, a little bit later in the presentation. And also, as an investigator, you may want to interview the person that took the photo um, and, and have an interview recorded and documented that, that on such and such a date they did take the photograph or they did take a series of photographs relating to um, the injury or, or whatever the case is to be able to show the documentation um, as to where the photo came from, how it was obtained and things like that. We'll talk a little bit about authentication shortly. Right. And I would just add that, um, you know, this may, the family member may send it to you and maybe the provider agency didn't know about the injury beforehand, um, then, you know, this is a reportable incident. If it hasn't been reported to um, the Justice Center, it should be. 
All right. Thank you. Thank you for those questions. They're great. Um, we're going to get, we're going to touch base here a little bit on bloodstain photography. And as uh, always, Maura has always um, mentioned that doesn't need to necessarily pertain only to bloodstains. This can be a hot oil from a, from a skillet on left on the stove or any, any other type of liquid that could be used. Um, so just keep that in mind when, as we're going through the presentation. So some best practices orient, orient blood stains to the rest of the scene. Um, make sure that blood stains found on victims or suspects, walls, floors, or other objects. You, we show a little bit of orientation to where they are located in the room uh, and, and things of that nature. We want to take an overall photograph to put them in context with the rest of the scene. We want to take close-ups using scales, and we'll show you what that is going to look like in a minute. Um, we want to use markers. Um, we're going to show you an example of markers in, in our next, um, in our next uh, photograph. Um, arrows, compasses, rulers, extending the length of the stain. Um, can indicate stain heights and provide a definitive point of reference. I'm going to show you what that looks like. Um, and generally, the uh, photographing blood stains and things um, is generally best when you're using oblique lighting. So here's our photos that we were talking about. So we have a mid-range photo, which clearly shows uh, orientation of the blood stains um, the blood spatter, things like that in perspective to the rest of the room. Clearly have landmarks that are easily identifiable. So very easy to make an orientation on where the stains are uh, in the room. Our close-up photo, we can clearly see our stains and spatter. Uh, the marker that they use are numerical markers here for this particular case. I always found that numerical markers work better because they're given a number and that number is going to be exclusively for, um, for that person. Mara? Um, you know, with, with this slide here, I think what, again, Chief talked about before, um, you know, the great example that we came up with is like, you know, potentially like grease stains for the burn that, you know, could produce various stain patterns on the objects. And like you see stain patterns here with blood spatter stain. But if, again, if we just think about this in like a potential kitchen incident, um, I'm, I'm sure, you know, many people on here in the past have had incidents with, you know, kitchen incidents. And so that's kind of the, why we wanted to spotlight this particular type of blood spatter uh, photos for this. Uh, particular slide. Thank you, Maura. Mm, yeah, okay. please, Maura. Gotcha. Gotcha, Chief. So what we're looking at here is um, just, again, a progression of stains. So if we start on the left-hand side, this is going to be an overall. This is going to be what we talked about before, an overall photo of the individual. Um, shows them, you know, from head to toe, the area that they're located in. Um, you see the little uh, circular den denoted around the shoe area of the overall. Now we're looking at that mid-range, you're seeing the shoes more clo close up, again, with denoted staining on there. And then the finally with the close up, um, the, we also have a scale with more enhanced uh, blood, blood splatter um, staining on the, the shoe itself. Um, anything on this one, Chief? My, my the, one of the things I can say about this this photograph or this slide here, this this is the essence of why we're teaching this course. These the progression of these photographs. This is exactly the way it should be done. So even if nothing else is done, this is the way that these photographs should be taken. Clearly identifies the victim or person of interest on the left clearly shows his entire body, what he's wearing, everything. The mid-range photo clearly showing his jeans and his shoes clearly a match 
to the overall photo and then the close up clearly showing the evidence where it's located with the use of a scale and you see the progression. There's no disputing what and who and where the evidence is located. So this is really um, one of the more important photographs that, that we have or slides that we have. Thanks, Chief. Um, so this is just, we're gonna be talking just very quickly of the use of carpenter ruler on documents, heights of blood stains. Again, um, everyone uh, on here, if you just orient yourself to various stainings that can occur or when you document it during your investigation, um, is, is try to use a carpenter ruler to document the heights of staining. Um, that could, again, be anything from grease stains to hot coffee stains to hot water. Um, if they do, if they had any type of grease in there, will also leave staining on the walls um, just to just to be able to measure that. Uh, Chief, do you have anything on this one, sir? That's a great point, Maura. And just just so that we're we know for orientation purposes where the stains are. So and by looking at this, you know, they're on the door. You see the locks clearly identifiable. And now, you know, where the stains are with the use of the of the ruler. So great depiction here of it. So we're going to move a little bit into motor vehicle photography. I'm not going to spend a tremendous amount of time, but just some best practices here. Um, you want to take overall mid range and close up photographs of a motor vehicle. You want to photograph each side in all four corners of the car. And for your close-ups, you want to do identifiable things that make this car or vehicle completely identifiable. You want to take a close-up of the license plate, of the VIN plate, usually located on the dash. You want to, any bumper stickers, decals, anything that, that is unique to that specific vehicle. Um, any unique identifying appearances, a, a, you know, a dent, a scratch, something that can clearly identify the vehicle later on. Uh, any specialized devices that are uh, unique to this vehicle inside the car, outside the car, lifts, things of that nature. When you're taking some uh, corner views of the car, these are what the this is the photograph that shows that. This is what they should be looking at. Shows all four sides of the car, actually all six sides of the car, um, because you are, you are able to see the roof and you are able to see the hood of the car as well. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of different angles here and that's the way it should be. Um, that's the way this should be photographed. Um, some side views of the car. This is just another, uh, this is just some different angles of taking the car. Some vehicle identification. We're looking here at the license plate, as we said, um, VIN plates, uh, registration stickers, inspection stickers. Inspection stickers now, the number, the inspection number here is unique to, to the car that it's on. So it is a very, um, strong identifying feature uh, for the vehicle. Some quick photos of the interior of the car. You can see, we can see the driver's side compartment, um, the, the back seat passenger compartment here. Um, we have the inside cab from a different angle and lo and behold, there we find our evidence sticking out of the ignition. So just some, some ways to photograph the car to, to, to show identifying features. So we're going to talk a little bit about authentication um, and just how do we authenticate the photographs that are taken. So our first is the New York State Administrative Procedure Act 306. Trial court requires authentication of all photographs or videos offered as evidence and made part of any record. So what this means is, um, and I'll just read a, 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 an excerpt from it. Um, All evidence which the agency wishes to avail itself shall be offered and made a part of the record, irrelevant on unduly repetition, 
irrelevant or unduly repetitious uh, photographs may be excluded. So that's just part of the law. We're still going to turn over everything that we have. Okay. Trial court, civil or criminal, requires authentication of the photograph or video. For our purposes, authentication should only go to the weight afforded the photo or video. Authenticating photographs. Um, what would authentication of a photograph look like um, in a Justice Center administrative case? So what we're going to talk about is uh, witness statements for photos or videos can be in writing or recorded audio statements. So what we were talking about just before, if we are provided with a photograph uh, from a witness, how do we authenticate that? We take a statement from them. Uh, we take a written statement or a recorded audio statement, who the person was, what their position is, uh, and why they took the photograph or the video of the scene. We want to do the same thing with a witness. And one of the questions that we want to ask uh, during this is if the photograph is fairly and accurately a depiction of what they're looking for. When, when you take a statement or an audio recording from a witness or uh, a, a person that took a photograph of something is, you want to ask that, is it fairly, does it fairly and accurately depict what you're looking to photograph? Familiarity with the incident. Um, for a witness to the event, or if the person is familiar with the incident, a witness statement indicating they are familiar with the person, place, or thing depicted in the photo. So they may not have witnessed the actual incident, but they may have witnessed or seen the victim after the incident with the injury. So you want to make sure also with that person that you're taking a uh, statement or audio recording um, that they are familiar with the person, they're familiar with the injury, and that it fairly and accurately depicts uh, the person, place, or thing that you are photographing. Sorry, I keep jumping here. Um, what is the depiction of the photograph? What is in the photo? What is... Um, what are you trying to show and represent? Um, if there is a discrepancy in the depiction of the photo, the witness or person taking the photograph should explain how it is different. How it is different from, you know, what you are investigating. And again, witness statements are invaluable. This is going to lay out uh, exactly where these photographs came from, how they were obtained, and that kind of thing. So it can't, th those photographs cannot be, um, th this section cannot be uh, emphasized enough. Maura, anything to add? Um, I, I think this just really summarize what we talked about today as far as authentication, as, as far as you know, even just setting up your camera properly, because everything leads to the finality of authenticating the photographs when potentially a year that uh, someone gets called in as a witness to testify to the photos that they took for that investigation. So like, like we said, it's best practices, you know, the use of scales, the log, the photo ledger, you know, having your camera where it's operational and, um, all of that is going to come down to then can we actually authenticate these photos um, to, you know, substantiate or unsubstantiate also, or when it comes for a hearing. So I think this really just ties everything together uh, of what we actually talked about today. Thank you, Mark. Excellent summation. Mark, I'll turn this over to you. Sure. So, 
some of the final considerations is that, you know, facilities must follow your protocols as we've talked about and let's say, and Chief and I, and as well as Davin have, have indicated to follow your protocols with your agency. Um, make sure that uh, marks and bruises on individuals are properly evaluated. Um, you know, if, if you don't have uh, the ch checklist or protocol, we highly recommend, again, um, as a best practice of using that scale um, to, uh, either locate or uh, uh, the absence of injuries um, from different angles, um, ensure the pictures if they are taken, the documentation that identifies the basic information of what the picture is and where it is on the body and when the photo was taken, again, first name, last name, and the position of who took that photo. Um, evaluate any needs for follow-ups with the persons receiving services. If they do need any uh, follow-ups with, uh, you know, medical treatment for potentially the injuries that they have. Um, and, you know, potentially looking at um, with these documenting these injuries, does the um, person receiving services have any um, compromising medical conditions such as osteoporosis that can potentially make this uh, injury worse? Um, that's all I have for that one, Chief. No, thank you, Moore. I appreciate that. Uh, just a couple other points on that. Um, Make sure that um, if an allegation of physical abuse require pictures be taken, um, remind the facility to follow their protocols. Um, please, one of the things, just make sure that the photographs are documented with who took the photos, what they are, what they are of, what the injuries are, um, and what the agency is, you know, use, the use of those cards really uh, help bring all of that home and, and really puts together a comprehensive professional package of what these photographs are and why they're needed and, and why they're so important. Thank you. There's, we have one question um, about when you're using a digital camera, is it best practice to um, maintain the original digital card that was used by the photographer to take the picture? Maura, what's your practice with that? Uh, when I take photos, as far as uh, with the uh, agent, uh, with us, I um, try to use an original SD card myself for that particular case, um, if, if that's available. Um, but it's not always available. And do you save that card somewhere in case you need it? Yes, if I, if, if I do use it, that card is saved uh, as, as far as the investigation package. Thank you. Thank you, Maura. And okay, so to summarize, uh, as we've done, um, investigative photographs can be a valuable, valuable resource. Can't overemphasize that enough. It really, people are going to be looking at these photos well after the incident. And determinations um, are going to be made more than likely based on those photographs. So they are a very big and valuable piece of your investigation. Correct camera setup and knowing the location and nature of the incident are critical to your photographs. Um, taking a series of photographs from long to close range. Um, be sure to log and document all photographs. We've, we've really, really stressed that a lot today. Um, if effective photographs orient the viewer to the scene, because remember, the people that are going to be looking at these photos were not there. They were not at the scene. So your photographs are going to tell a huge story. You want to capture unique or identifying features for easy identification purposes. You want to use a scale and use it correctly. Collect photographs over time to capture progression of an injury if it's applicable and if it's necessary. And just remember that all photographs at some point that go to a trial or a hearing or anything like that are going to need to be authenticated. Where did they come from? Who took them? And um, you're gonna need to, to be able to document that. Maura, did I miss anything? 
No, Chief, uh, I, I, I think you hit it all. Uh, one thing I just wanted to go back, uh, dab into that one question regarding the SD cards. Um, one of the other practices that could be utilized if, if uh, persons do not have multiple SD cards is the use of that photo ledger. If, if you do have to start again uh, with it, that's starting that particular succinct uh, photos for that particular date and time by that particular investigator that would be taking those photos as well. Thank you. Thank you, Maura. I don't see any more questions. Is this your last? Yeah, that's your last slide. Um, so I don't see any more questions. Thank you very much. Um, I learned a lot today. Thank you all for the great questions, um, for everybody who participated. And um, maybe we'll see you tomorrow for our last two sessions. And I'd just like to say uh, thank you to everyone for your time and patience with this presentation. I hope we gave you a little bit of insight into uh, photography and how it, it really can enhance our uh, investigation. So thank you all for your, for your time today. Have a nice evening, everyone.